Welcome to our public forum today. Uh, for my students, make sure you register your name to get attendance credit, okay? Students, attendance credit uh, with the registration desk outside. Uh, let us proceed uh, by inviting uh, Adan Ek, uh, Professor Ek, and Sabatana, the Dean of the Faculty of Book Science at Jalan University, to provide some opening <coughs> remarks and then and we'll begin. Good morning to all of you and welcome to Jalan Longkorn University, uh, oldest and the most celebrated uh, building here at the Faculty of Arts. For those who you were not in, with us uh, from the last uh, forum, uh, our usual venue on the fourth floor of the Pacha, King Pachatipok building uh, is undergoing uh, renovation until early next year. So we will have been using different facilities on campus for ISIS uh, events over the next few months. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, family topics to our audience. Uh, also, ISIS Thailand covers a wide range of policy issues and research interests. Our main focus has long been East Asia in general and ASEAN and Southeast Asia in particular. More recently, uh, we have been paying more attention to mainland Southeast Asia around the Mekong River, or what ISIS Thailand likes to call the Mekong mainland, as it is a dynamic region full of potential and promise. It is also a region that is coming into its own uh, uh, concentric fashion within the frames of uh, CLMT or Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, uh, and of the GMS, or the Greater Mekong sub-region. This is a rising region that is the mainland part of ASEAN, but also a region with it, its own interval, diverse, and logic. But there is also a flip side to the growth potential of the Mekong mainland. Rapid economic development requires energy utilization and the protection of the environment. The Mekong mainland countries must find a balance between environmental concerns and energy needs, particularly the hydropower development in upstream areas and adversely affect downstream countries. Satisfying energy demands with environmental sustainability is a pressing and paramount challenge. This public forum launches a crucial report on the Mekong mainland's energy development and environmental protection by the Stimson Center Southeast Asia program. The report challenges opportunities and a new narrative on hydropower development, updates and breaks new crowd in primary research and analysis of prospects and scenarios in the Mekong neighborhood. It also builds on our last major public forum on the Mekong mainland as an axis of prosperity, security, and competition from December 2014. It is my pleasure to open this forum today and I thank uh, the Stimson Center for working with us. In particular, let me show gratitude to uh, Dr. Richard uh, Konin, uh, Director of Southeast Asia Program. Ms. Courtney Weserby, Research Associate of the Southeast Asia Program, and Mr. Brian uh, Eiler, Deputy Director of the Southeast Asia Program. All of them from the 
uh, Stimson Center, Washington DC, uh, USA. In addition, I have two discussants who are experts on the Mekong mainland from our own faculty, namely uh, Professor Nalimon Tapjumpon and uh, Dr. Carl uh, Middleton. Many thanks to all uh, panelists uh, for sharing their time and expertise uh, with us. Now, uh, I have to apologize because uh, I'm still uh, in teaching time now and I have a break uh, to, uh, to come here for this uh, open ceremony. I think uh, you will find a Simpson report, Simpson report refreshing and stimulating and uh, ensuring discuss discussion relevant to how we need to work together to develop the Mekong mainland in a uh, concerted way. Uh, thank you very much for all of you to come in, and I would like to return uh, the floor to uh, Ajahn Tikinan. Thank you. Let me invite those in the back. There are a number of seats still open in the front row. If you want to come closer to the stage, you're welcome to. Uh, now we will begin to, uh, with uh, our main proceedings. Uh, so today we're here because the Stimson Center is here. Uh, Stimson Center Southeast Asia Programs. The Stimson Center is here with a new report called New Narrative. So we want to know what is a new narrative? Why is it new? Uh, what has been a, a, a narrative, the conventional mainstream, uh, the narrative that we're used to, that we have known? Uh, the Stimson Center is represented today by uh, Dr. Richard Cronin, uh, Ms. Courtney Weatherby, and uh, Mr. Brian Eiler. So they have uh, divided the, the workload, the presentation among themselves. I think we have some flexibility. We have until noon. Uh, so you have some flexibility with time. We normally would like to leave 20 minutes to 30 minutes uh, at least for, for some discussion and for some questions and comments. Uh, so let me turn over the floor to, to the three of you, and then after that, I'll introduce the, the discussants. The bios uh, you have in front of you, so I don't need to go into the details. They're all experts, and they have been researchers on the mainland, Mekong mainland, the Mekong the development, Mekong region development for, for some time. Dr. Cronin. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, and thank you for, for coming to this presentation. Uh, we, my colleagues and I from the Stimson Center, uh, owe a, a gratitude uh, to, uh, to uh, Ajahn uh, Dignan and uh, to Ajahn Ache, eight, uh, eight, sorry, uh, and uh, Ajahn uh, Nuruiman uh, for uh, agreeing to not only uh, host the program but, and introduce it, but also uh, in the latter two cases with a uh, commentary at the falls. Uh, I just want to say uh, just a quick word about uh, the Stimson Center. Uh, Stimson is a rather small, middle-sized anyway, uh, think tank, if you will, or research institution in Washington, in Washington D.C. Uh, and we, um, we're non-partisan, uh, non-government, uh, definitely non-profit. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, we try to work on, uh, on two uh, principal uh, 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 frameworks, or, or uh, if you will, our signature is, uh, in terms of the kind of work we do, is, is to focus on, uh, first of all, um, practical or pragmatic solutions to issues that seem to be irresolvable. Uh, and uh, this Mekong uh, issue right now is, is one of them. Uh, and the other, which is also definitely applies to the Mekong, is to, to focus on transboundary uh, issues and transnational issues. Everything from, uh, particularly with regard to uh, uh, so-called non-traditional security issues, environmental issues, pollution, uh, you know, all the things that occur because of globalization and the growing exploitation of, uh, of natural resources and how that affects, uh, how that flows across boundaries. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, uh, we're funded primarily by foundations. Our program here uh, today is uh, uh, largely supported by the MacArthur Foundation, and we're uh, very grateful for them for their uh, support, as well as uh, one or two other smaller uh, foundations, uh, depending on the year-to-year year -year basis. Uh, so, uh, let me begin. Um, 
And, and the first is that, uh, uh, as everyone here knows, that the Mekong is one of the world's most important river systems. Um, and the way the Mekong epitomizes the uh, critical worldwide struggle to uh, find a sustainable balance in the growing tension between uh, involving the, the so-called nexus uh, and um, of, of, uh, of increasing demands for energy, food, and other uses of rapidly, rapidly shrinking freshwater resources. So in the lower Mekong, there's a, a still a lot of water, and uh, it's a, a southern, southeast Asian part of the of Mekong Basin is relatively water rich, but of course, it's also issues of quality of water. And, and, and as, as in addition, these uh, dams that are planned for uh, and now getting started in Laos and uh, Cambodia uh, in the future uh, would have a huge impact on uh, uh, on on fisheries uh, and on sediment flows and in more generally on on food security and agriculture and also the the, the future of the Mekong Delta because the Delta uh, it depends on sediment coming down from uh, Tibet and China and then uh, the lower uh, Mekong and tributaries uh, to sustain itself against the South China Sea. And there's 19 million people approximately that live and work in the Delta, very densely populated, and it's also uh, half or more of Vietnam's uh, rice crop every year. So it's very, very critical issues. And uh, some, uh, uh, many people working on this issue uh, from environmental or uh, other standpoints uh, uh, tend to focus on uh, the issue itself, uh, the substance of the, uh, you know, the uh, impacts of, of dams. Uh, but we also look at this from a perspective of regional stability. So I, I just mentioned the Mekong Delta, I mentioned food security, livelihoods, etc. And in, in, in terms of food security, we're talking about tens of millions of people that are substantially to almost totally dependent on the natural part of the river, a natural uh, bounty of the river. But at the same time, uh, we, I wanted to add the caveat that you know, we're not, we're not, uh, our, our position is not don't build any dams. And our position is not, uh, I think, uh, a, a quote from uh, Nelson Mandela, which is maybe apocryphal, uh, I've never actually been able to find in the writing, but I've heard it said uh, that Nelson Mandela said, I'm all for uh, uh, environmental sustainability but I'm not for the sustainability of poverty. So we understand to be a fisher, uh, to be a farmer uh, in, in this region, particularly the lower Mekong, uh, is, is a hard life and, and the river really affects, it's the richest resource, but in fact it's, uh, it's uh, inhabited primarily by the poorest uh, people. So we're not against dams. What we're focusing on is the issue of optimization of the trade-offs between energy and uh, uh, food security, water, and other, other uses of water, etc. So the, um, actually the lower half of the river is, amounts to about 20% of uh, total global production of freshwater fish. It's a huge amount, many, many times uh, uh, U.S. production of freshwater fish, for instance. I think uh, something like, uh, uh, I'll, I'll get the number, uh, the quantity wrong partly, but it's something like, uh, 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 2,000 in the case of the Mekong, I think million metric tons, something like that, or uh, tons, and and uh, and 150 for the U.S. The main point is I I can't remember the, the exact measurement, but the but the scale is is, is huge, and the same for uh, other other parts of the world, uh, mo most other parts of the world. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we we so we share the views of. Uh, Many critics, if not most critics of the project, particularly on environmental and food security grounds in terms of uh, development models, et cetera. Uh, but um, we, we start to look at this issue more from, uh, again, the practical realities. And one of the practical realities that we find as a result of our field research and visit site, pro site visits to the Sabori and Don Sahong Dam projects in Laos, uh, many numerous discussions with experts, uh, uh, people from the multilateral banks, uh, people from uh, USAID and other donor aid agencies, uh, certainly, uh, certainly uh, biologists, hydrologists, etc. Uh, and particularly looking at the issue of the business model of these projects uh, has, has led us to a somewhat different conclusion than the, uh, 
the existing narrative, uh, which in a sense sees the fact that Laos began the Sayabori Dam project and now is starting the Don Sahong project in terms of site preparation. Uh, in the face of, uh, by, by uh, really um, slighting uh, its obligations in terms of issues like environmental impact assessments. There's not been a good one uh, for either project. Uh, and also its obligations, the treaty obligations under the, uh, under the Mekong River Commission in the 1995 uh, Mekong Treaty or, or Mekong Accord to, uh, to a process, a protocol uh, that the MRC has for so for they call it uh, for notification prior consultation and agreement. Uh, so on the face of it, yes, it looks it does look very bad. Uh, but uh, Courtney, I'm going to turn this over to Courtney uh, in a minute, my, my colleague. Uh, you know, we'll talk about you know what the exact nature of the, the current uh, dialogue uh, narrative and and uh, how uh, uh, how we uh, evaluate it and how we differ. In our in our uh, outlook on on these assumptions, um, so uh, equally important, not more important, uh, we believe that even at this late stage, that is, two projects already started. One uh, you'll see the, on our cover of our, our, our program, the Savory Dam. That's what it looked like in December uh, uh, last year, in the middle of December, when Courtney and I were there to do site visits and. Uh, uh, but we, we still don't think it's too late uh, for um, policy changes uh, by the governments uh, in particular and by donors uh, and, and, fin and financial organizations that maybe not too late for policy changes that could optimize uh, the nexus trade-offs among energy, food, and, and other uses of water on a lower Mekong basin scale. So what we're talking about, and we'll get deeper into this, is, is there a way to optimize these trade-offs that, that looks at the nexus concept as, as the underlying concept or principle for basin development. Uh, so rather than looking at energy output, rather than just focusing on, uh, on environment or food security, et cetera, how do you, how do you help for instance, Laos, for instance, get what it needs and wants in terms of export revenues? Uh, and also, uh, but also other, uh, satisfy other stakeholders, uh, and, uh, uh, and particularly the, those downstream who are gonna actually receive more impact uh, in, in terms of transboundary uh, impacts than, than the benefit that, that will accrue to Laos. So it's, it's be a very complicated situation, but again, to go back, go back to the issue of how do you do, find practical answers, you have to find answers that somehow will bring all stakeholders to the table and, uh, and, and change the, the dynamics. Uh, so uh, these emerging factors could shift uh, the current narrative of inevitability surrounding Mekong hydropower de development and lead to a differing and uh, hopefully more sustainable uh, dire development direct, uh, trajectory for the, for the uh, river. Uh, and so um, uh, in addition uh, to our discussion, Brian, uh, Mr. Courtney will talk about the narrative and how we see the changes and have developed a new narrative. And, and, and Brian, uh, my colleague, will talk about the China factor was also important, very important to this, uh, to this issue. And then finally, just a quick mention, you know, Thailand is a big factor, uh, perhaps the biggest factor right now in the whole issue of how the Mekong is developed because Thailand's the biggest market and uh, uh, the first project, Sabori, was totally a Thai project just carried out in Laos uh, for Thai banks, uh, the big, yes, the big uh, 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 Thai banks, uh, the second largest construction company in Thailand. Uh, EGAT is the uh, uh, electric generating authority of Thailand is the customer for 95% of the power that will come off the, uh, the Sayabori Dam. Uh, so uh, we don't want to leave uh, at all, leave Thailand out of the picture uh, in talking about this issue even though much of the conflict or con much of the, the, the uh, uh, contending arguments have to do with the, the river itself and what and Laos plan for up to nine dams and Cambodia's uh, consideration of another two uh, very big and very uh, uh, environmentally damaging uh, dams in, in uh, the lower part of the river. 
Okay, uh, for me, I'm done for now, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Courtney Weatherby. Courtney has been with Stimson uh, since May last year when she got her, uh, her master's degree in, uh, from Georgetown University, uh, and had with us, been with us briefly before that. So she's uh, really, as we say, hit the ground running in terms of uh, our work on this issue, and particularly uh, in terms of the, the narrative and the, the results of our site visits. Thank you. Look, let me contextualize uh, our discussions. What we're concerned about uh, here, you know, there's something analogous between the Mekong region and the South China Sea. So in the South China Sea, we know a lot about South China Sea because the South China Sea is in the news. And in the South China Sea, there are different parties doing different things uh, unilaterally, unilateral actions with regional consequences and implications. So the Chinese are building airports out of the sea, uh, landing strips and so on. And this has a lot of uh, uh, consequences for, for the other countries who also claim the South China Sea. Uh, and in South China Sea, they have the declaration on the code of conduct of the parties uh, in 2000, uh, 2002. And now they're working on a code of conduct. So uh, Thailand is not part of the, we're not a claimant to the South China Sea. And the South China Sea is full of tension, rising tension, but analogous to it, here uh, in our mainland region, we have the Mekong. And the Mekong is being exploited, being used, utilized uh, unilaterally. There is no regional framework or agreement to uh, work out how, you know, who gets to use the Mekong, in which way, and uh, who uh, is allowed to build dams, how many dams, and so on. So all we know is that the dams are being built, but we don't have yet the kind of tension and conflict we're seeing in the South China Sea but they could come, they could come, and that's what we want to, uh, to address. In addition, unlike the South China Sea, um, I mean, the habitats, the livelihoods of the Mekong region, very sensitive. They live on the river. I mean, there's fisheries involved in the South China Sea, but you know, South China Sea is a vast expanse. The Mekong is very limited, especially in the, uh, the dry season. Uh, so here's our context uh, locally. We're also concerned about transnational crime, uh, the kind of the integration, the mixed bag of integration that we have in mainland Southeast Asia. There's an increasing, increasingly integrated labor market. We have Myanmar workers here, Laotians, uh, Cambodians. More than 700,000 Cambodians work in Thailand. Uh, so the kind of integration, apart from the labor, uh, healthcare, uh, retail finance, uh, and more to come. So I think it's very much market-driven, the, the kind of integration we're seeing in mainland Southeast Asia, very much market-driven, but governments uh, and formal frameworks to manage and govern uh, the issues and rising tension, uh, we don't have, and that's, that's what we're looking at. Okay? Now, with that kind of uh, local context, uh, um, let me pass the, the floor to Ms. Courtney Weatherby. All right, so as Rich already laid out, um, you know, when we started our work on the Mekong years ago, as we published in the past 2010, 2012, very similar arguments to what Rich is saying. First, the domino narrative, the narrative of inevitability. Concerns over the fact that, you know, the Mekong River Commission is not as effective an institution as people had hoped, that diplomacy has so far been unable to bring the, uh, the halt of mainstream projects that many view as damaging. And the sort of concern that once Shebari and Don Sahang are built, these are bookends, and that the continued cumulative impacts will be increasingly, um, and increasingly inevitable and also increasingly serious. This is the view that we had when we started working on our most recent iteration of this project and doing the site visits to the Shebari project and the Don Sahang site in 2014 in December. We were in. We went in with somewhat pessimistic views, um, but we wanted to make sure that we were engaging with all stakeholders. And what emerged from our discussions with the developers at Seabury and the researchers, the fisheries researchers at the Dan Sahong project site, um, was actually that there was more positive signs than we had anticipated originally. Um, you know, one of the challenges with uh, the Seabury project is that there was a great deal of opacity about what was done with the project. You know, the, it came out of the Mekong River Commission. Um, the preparatory work continued, but the uh, actual construction of the dam was sort of halted for a year. They said they were doing research, they said they made changes, but there was a lack of understanding of what those changes were. And what we found is that 
despite the fact that the changes were not ideal, you know, there is no easy way to mitigate the impacts on fisheries given the vast number of species and the vast amount of fish that migrate up the river, that they had made some substantive changes to the dam. They changed the, um, the length of it. They added some relatively new technology for a fish lift system and for a bypass system for fish as they migrated back down. And they did some research. And overall, they spent about $200 million on those changes just for the fisheries, which also included additional changes not counted in that to the powerhouse structure and to the overall dam design. Um, and so th that was more impact than we had actually anticipated. We had assumed we would come out from that site visit with very little information about what had changed and with the assumption that the changes were not substantive. And what we found was that they actually were more substantive than expected. And similarly, when we were visiting the Don Sahong site that month, um, we were surprised at the amount of research and enthusiasm among the fisheries research team. They were doing a lot of monitoring of the different channels they'd identified and they actually noted um, that they had some interesting reasons for this, that there were two other channels apart from the Hosahong, which is the main migration channel used during the dry season for fish to swim upstream, that there were two other channels that were now accessible. They're not as wide, deep, or well recognized as Hosahong, but that there is some travel upstream. Um, they noted actually at the time that they think this may have been the result of the increased flow during the dry season from the Chinese dams upstream. So it may be a recent development but was still significant. Um, and they also had been doing some experimentation with using light and sonar warnings to try and guide fish away. Some of this is, of course, experimental. But the overall picture that we emerged with was that there is some interesting work being done here. And after speaking with some fisheries experts, reason to believe that at Dong Sahong in particular, there is a chance for better mitigation than previously anticipated. At the same time, we're still concerned about these impacts. Obviously, in most cases, there's no way to really tell the actual impacts of the changes in the experimental work that they're doing until the dams have been built. That's something that we're very concerned about. But at the same time, we think that the increased transparency seen with the Don Sahong site, the willingness to purchase more, uh, to publish more of the data that they found and to engage with civil society at an earlier stage in the planning process, while the engagement is limited, is still a positive shift in behavior. And this led us to the question of why? Why was there a change in behavior between what we saw in Sayabury and what we saw with the mega first company that's developing the Don Sahong Dam? And led us to sort of the concept of a partial success, if you will. You know, the goal for most of the people concerned with these projects is that these dams are halted or at least suspended until there's been further study. And the situation is better understood in the region. You know, there's not enough information about fisheries. There's not enough information about water flow and the impacts are very, you know, likely to be very serious. So the lack of information is a concern. But at the same time, despite that, the impact of the ongoing public pressure from civil society, diplomatic engagement from other countries, and reputational risks through these, these dam developers has actually led to some changes in behavior. And we think that that's a positive trend. We think it's a step forward that Megafirst was engaging to a greater extent than the Shayabury company was. And so we wanted to investigate this further. Now, generally, we feel that the most obvious reason for this is the public pressure. You know, there are many groups engaged protesting against whether both international groups, local groups, civil society organizations, people that are very concerned about their own livelihoods. And many of these groups have come together and raised some of the political stakes for these projects. The most immediate impact of this are lawsuits filed against the, the company is involved. Um, the case probably best known here is the one that was brought up to the Thailand Supreme Administrative Court um, against EGAT for a power purchase agreement, which is potentially unconstitutional. But there were other cases as well. There is a, an OECD case brought against Poiri, the Finnish uh, consultant for the project. There is an ongoing case brought against Andritz, which is the turbine supplier for the project. And this raises reputational risk for the companies involved and particularly for international companies. This is a concern. You know, there, there are limits to the impact that reputational risk will have on companies that are, you know, perhaps like the Shayabari company, for instance, which is funded, it's a, it's a first project outside of Thailand. It's funded by Thai banks. It's got some government guarantees for this project. But for a company like Mega First, which is a private company um, that has projects in many other countries, um, the reputational risk is perhaps more of a concern. 
It also raises the public pressure impact on government. Um, in the case of Sayabury, there was some delay due to diplomatic pressure on the Lao government from donors from neighboring countries. Um, in other cases, the most evidence among those being the Mietzon Dam in Myanmar, concerns over the impacts of the project led to widespread public protests and pressure, which led the government to make the decision to suspend the dam. Um, and I think we've seen a similar situation in with the Arang Dam in Cambodia, where there are, um, you know, there's just enough pressure. These companies are concerned, but more so the governments are concerned. In some cases, it becomes a legitimacy issue. And so this has led to a greater amount of pressure on, or, sorry, this has led to, um, you know, greater hesitancy from some of these countries to move forward with these projects. That's a positive trend in our view. And it is entirely due to the fact that there is ongoing and in many cases increasing public protests and pressure on these companies. You know, and in the narrative of inevitability, the concept is, you know, once these projects move forward, the public pressure will decrease because the impacts will already be there. There's nothing that can be done about the dams that are already in place or very little that can be done about the dams that are already in place. But what we've seen in recent years is that there's actually been a rise in pressure rather than a decrease in pressure against these projects. And in perhaps more in line with what we're just saying and of more import to the future work that we'll be doing is the business case against these projects. Since the World Commission on Dams, it's been accepted, especially by the large multinational banks, that big investment projects like these are risky. They tend to, um, they tend to have cost overruns. They tend to have delays in the scheduling. Um, they often tend to not perform as well as expected, both financially and in production of energy. And so for a time, we saw many of the multinational banks sort of edging away from doing these large infrastructure projects. They were viewed as too risky. They were viewed as perhaps potentially not a good investment. This was actually reinforced by a recent study done in Oxford last year, where um, they reviewed something like 250 large dams over the world and found the same thing. They found, you know, the cost overruns in some cases ran to, I think, 90% was what I'd seen for the worst case scenario. Scheduled delays contributed to this, but also made the project less effective for addressing short term security needs in the countries that were building them. And equally importantly, many of the countries that built these large projects tended to underestimate the social and environmental impacts that were not going to be addressed by the developer. You know, in, in the cases of the Mekong mainstream dams, there are, are you know, the, the discussion is why there, it's widely understood that these projects will have serious impacts. But the government of Laos in particular is not addressing these impacts and the downstream countries are having challenges addressing that. But these impacts will be felt, you know, whether it's in decreased food security for people, whether it's in sudden migrations of villages where, you know, they don't, they're not relocated to a good location. Many of them migrate to cities. You have a lot of movement. Um, and these are challenges for governance. These are challenges that governments should care about. And the long-term impacts on the environment will also impact the long-term resource accessibility, which in many cases, as Rich mentioned, particularly for Vietnam in this case, you know, the long-term sustainability of the Delta is of vital economic importance. These costs are widely underestimated by the governments involved, and this has been shown in the case of many project, past projects. So, this leads to sort of the question, you know, with many multinational development banks, many of the Western countries not interested in funding these projects anymore, who will fund them? And that's where the China factor comes in, and where I'm going to turn it to Brian to discuss that aspect. Before you do that, thank you. Uh, Courtney, let me just uh, add a couple of those before pass it to, to Brian. Uh, and that is, uh, first of all, uh, on, on the issue of mitigation, we know we're kind of sticking our neck out to talk about how some of these, uh, some of these efforts may have some degree of success. Uh, but uh, the point here is that um, uh, it connects to the issue of the role of the MRC, Make Our River Commission. It's been widely disparaged for being weak and ineffectual, and in many ways it is, although it does some very good research. and. Uh, it is still a, a, a forum a for, a for uh, interaction uh, on these issues among the, the four Mekong River Commission governments at the <coughs> Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and, and Vietnam. Uh, but uh, uh, the MRC uh, did a technical review as a result of this protocol for reviewing the projects that was very critical uh, and uh, of, the, of the designs 
uh, of both projects, and that led to these redesign efforts. Now, on the issue of uh, fish passage in the in the Sayaboy Dam, the MRC technical review was, you know, basically said, look, uh, there's really no good way to get uh, fish that's now a known technology over a 32 meter high high, high dam, and particularly in the bulk uh, of uh, fish that are on the move when, when they're when they're migrating. Uh, but they did have suggestions about sediment flow, and so the company, in addition to redoing a fish bass and adding some innovation, but they also swapped out four of the gates, uh, sluice gates for the dam, to make them more uh, easy to flush the sediment uh, through the dam. And in the case of the Don Sahon project, it's all about fisheries, it's not about sediment. And, and here I think uh, there's some reason to, to think, uh, be a little more optimistic. But again, uh, as Courtney mentioned, no one will know until the projects are up and running. And then it's, then it's uh, too late. Uh, but to segue into uh, Brian's uh, uh, presentation and his comments, it, is that uh, uh, there's a big issue about uh, investment, infrastructure investment in this region. Uh, and of course, China is a huge factor in that. But the point, the special point about these Mekong uh, mainstream projects is that for, for the ADB or the World Bank or Western donors, uh, these are not, quote, bankable, end quote, projects. You can't get financing for these because the, the, the donors believe that the impact is way in excess of the, of the benefits. Uh, so then, uh, but we have a, also the reality that, uh, so, so some of the uh, Thai company, Sayaburi company, and uh, uh, Mega First, there we can see their response of, about their reputation and about uh, uh, criticism of their projects, and they're trying to do some things uh, to help anyway, uh, belatedly. But when it comes to China, that's a new factor uh, that we don't know uh, how that's going to change the game if it will. But the next two projects upcoming. Uh, in Laos uh, are, are the Pak Bang and Pak Lei dams. Uh, you see them on the map over there. Uh, and they, they are Chinese projects. And so there's one set of uh, assumptions we've made about international companies, not kind of China, uh, and even the Thai companies, but China's a, the China role is a different one and, and uh, no one's better able to talk about it than our colleague uh, uh, Brian. Uh, either and uh, who's lived 15 years in China and and five uh, half half of them are a little more than half in Beijing and other half in Kunming. Uh, where we're we going uh, tomorrow? Uh, and uh, you wanted to make a comment. Doctor. Yes, thank you very much. Before we proceed to Brian, either um, let me just say to the uh, audience that this is the report is available to, uh, out at the registration desk. You can have it for free. Now there are limited copies. Uh, we also have them in a PDF file. So just send an email to ISIS if you want a copy of the report. And they're online. Um, they're online at Simpson Center. Okay. Yes. Um, now, at this time, I think we can kind of summarize the basic, I mean, what is new narrative? The newness is that public opposition and public pressure do work, right? That's why the old narrative uh, has to be updated. And there's a new narrative up to a point. <coughs> Uh, so that's the main main message so far. Now, yesterday we just had a visiting delegation of a think tank, um, scholars and analysts from China. And the Chinese, as you know, uh, have uh, some big plans with the One Belt, One Road. Uh, sometimes we call it now, I think, the Belt Road Initiative. Also with a attendant financing arm uh, known as the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, so the Chinese are really uh, making themselves known and, uh, and seen and assertive, uh, and this is consequential for Mekong development. Uh, Brian, Ayla. Thank you, John um, I'd, I'd like for you to uh, consider that the entire situation, uh, part of our new narrative is that the current situation is entirely in flux. Uh, the, the dominant domino theory is kind of a static uh, idea that one dam will, will follow the next and, uh, until they're all built. Um, and within this idea of dynamism and flux is a changing China and how 
changes in China right now uh, will affect the future of the Mekong. Uh, as, as Richard said, as Dr. Cronin said, the, the next two dam projects, the Pak Bang and the Pak Lei, as well as one of the dams in Cambodia, are known to be uh, Chinese invested uh, projects. Um, that's not the end of the plans for China. We um, have understood that the Don Sahong Dam in southern Laos uh, will be contracted to Sino Hydro from Megafirst to Sino Hydro. Um, so China's interests here are, are deep, uh, and uh, the, the plans, uh, if we follow the domino theory, are expected to carry out. But all of this is happening in a period of great change for China. Um, there's a lot of evidence showing that China cares more about its image abroad, or needs to, to care more about its image abroad. Uh, the China state-owned enterprises are improving in terms of their corporate social responsibility. There's evidence to suggest this. Um, and that um, China's taking a greater role in international initiatives, specifically regarding hydropower development. Um, China has signed on to the Sustainable Hydropower Assessment Program, uh, which is managed by uh, and, and derived by Western states and Western NGOs. Um, and, uh, and all of this is happening against the backdrop of economic woes in China. So I want you to consider, just to always keep in mind that, that the situation is continually in flux. It's not a static situation. Um, Economic woes in China at the same time as the, the new, well, not so new Chinese leader Xi Jinping is attempting to push through some critical reforms uh, that will affect China's footprint in the Mekong region. Um, the reforms are specifically targeted at state owned enterprises and expansion of the private market, which spells for both state owned enterprise reform and private market expansion a shift from shoddy projects. Uh, that are corrupt uh, or that kind of follow the same line of China not caring about um, environmental practices or environmental safeguards and impacts uh, to one where perhaps there's more uh, attention given to these impacts. Uh, and at the same time as a shift uh, from policy type projects, projects that are there to fulfill uh, specific policy needs such as the One Belt, One Road initiative uh, that will connect markets between China and Southeast Asia and China, um, Asia at large, Europe and Africa uh, to more commercially viable projects. Uh, there'll be a shift uh, from, I guess, a soft budget constraint to something that's a little bit uh, harder in terms of budget constraints or projects that will produce a return, a commercial return for these Chinese firms. Um, and at the same time, with, at the backdrop of this current round of economic woes in China, we have to admit that China is bleeding cash right now um, and its assets. Uh, in, in trying to defend its currency, you need to take a lot of renminbi to buy up all that foreign currency that's coming into China and then hold the same amount of renminbi uh, in frozen assets in the Chinese central bank. And this, this is a, a clampdown on liquidity within, within China. Uh, a lot of cash is either being injected into the system or being frozen. Uh, and this places a constraint on China's capabilities at home and abroad, uh, specifically in the Mekong. Um, to solve some of the, the economic woes, China is injecting a lot of cash. We saw this summer um, how China injected a lot of cash into the stock market uh, to tr try and save the stock market. Um, a lot of criticism says that that didn't work and it was the wrong approach. Uh, and it, it asks a lot of questions as to Xi Jinping's measures um, and uh, an approach to solving some of these economic problems. Um, while China is uh, defending its currency and devaluating its, cu its currency, it's walking into a situation where very likely China will have close to a negative trade balance or zero um, trade balance, which is a departure from before. So again, it's, it's having to uh, support um, its economic position uh, with its own assets. And uh, this can't go on forever. I think a, a, a good indicator of how this can't go on forever is there's the rhetoric of how much China is promising to invest abroad or to give an aid and assistance abroad um, compared to how much it actually gives. And we can look at uh, examples from Indonesia, you can look at examples from Africa where the pledges are tens of billions of dollars, but what really shows up is a small portion of that. 
And, and can we think of Mekong plans in, in a similar context? Um, at some point, I believe some factions uh, within China will begin to criticize Xi Jinping with this um, kind of errant fiscal policy uh, or, or out of control fiscal policy uh, to provide some uh, challenges to his own leadership, um, particularly if the reforms that are on the table cannot move through. Uh, and at the same time, um, in, in China, I believe that there, a lot of people are asking the question, uh, with all this outbound investment and all this assistance abroad and, and one belt, one road and, and these grand plans, um, folks at home are gonna start to say, well, things aren't really getting better for us here uh, and, and request or somewhat require uh, a drawing back and a, and a refocusing of attention onto the domestic economic situation in China. So that's the backdrop of this. And uh, in order to make the transition uh, I, I, I believe and I think our team believes that there will be a shift from policy-based projects or, sh or shoddy uh, investments, which are two different things, uh, to those that are more viable and those that are more bankable. And uh, if, you, if you think of the Mietzon Dam, uh, the Arang Dam in Cambodia and other projects in Africa uh, that fail, uh, many of them are, 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 are suspended. Uh, these assets just kind of sit there for a long time and uh, be become a problem, they become, a, I guess, a, a negative soft power uh, scar for China, uh, something that can, can sit there and consistently uh, take criticism. And I, I don't believe that, that the, the government of China wants to see these types of projects persist. Um, another similar model, uh, we've learned that uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, there was the case of a, a harbor uh, port investment in Sri Lanka where uh, Chinese state-owned enterprise essentially paid a lot of money to Sri Lankan president at that time uh, to have the, the president request aid um, or for, for China to invest in a harbor structure uh, for in the president's hometown. And that didn't go over very well uh, for Sri Lanka nor did it go over very well for, for China. Um, the Sri Lankan president was not re-elected uh, in this particular case, and it caused some major factionalism, factional divides uh, between uh, some state-owned enterprises and ministries within the Chinese government. This type of this type of trend uh, will probably be be reined in, and 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 again, this marks the the need for a shift to more commercially viable projects. Hence, the question: Are the dams on the Mekong commercially viable? And will Chinese SOEs begin to see them through this particular lens? Will we see a shift from the build, own, operate, transfer model to one where Chinese firms are contracted to build dams and then leave uh, and not be willing to take on the, the underlying risks of managing or operating these projects? If that is the case, and we believe it to be true as, as from our conversations with, uh, with Exim banks in China, uh, that the, the, the shift to, to not want to be involved in these risky projects will transfer the risk to somebody else, some other group. And there's a large question mark within that. Can the state of Laos, can the government of Laos, um, or firms, state-owned enterprises within Laos, take on, say, the Peck Bang Dam after it is completed? Uh, or the Pak Lei, or the Sambor Dam in Cambodia? That's a big question mark. And uh, so if this shift does happen, then it spells a lot of riskiness uh, for the future of, of um, hydropower development in the Mekong. Uh, at the same time, as these uh, state-owned enterprises, we hope will become less corrupt, uh, what they get out of it will also decrease. So let's say a, a project like a hydropower project might not be commercially viable, but within the, the negotiation package of constructing a dam, let's say in Laos, the state-owned enterprise is going to look for other concessions. Uh, so let's say it's a real estate development project in Vientiane um, that is also built by that state-owned enterprise or some other type of commercial project where they can make a lot of money on. Um, I, I think that this, this is a real conflict of interest um, as China's 
becoming or wanting to become more transparent or raise its image uh, within the region, this type of these, these types of concessions will be divided off um, and, and a wall will be built to prevent state owned enterprises from taking advantage of, of situations in, in this way. Um, so they're going to get less out of it, which spells less interest. Um, and then lastly, the, the idea of financial institutions. Um, I think there's a lot of concern about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIAB, and how it will play a role within the One Belt, One Road, within uh, hydropower investments potentially uh, in, in Southeast Asia. But one way to think about this is, is it's a way to also rein in kind of um, out of control Chinese investment abroad, to bring in more regional voices on financial decision making and loan decision making, and also Western voices, even though those Western voices will not exceed more than 25% of uh, decision making power within the AIAB. The, this is an institution uh, that China seeks to, to learn from, um, that China seeks to help improve its image abroad uh, with this institution, uh, as well as um, bring in more voices, which I think is, is, is necessary. Uh, and one last point is that uh, there are some effective measures coming out of the loan process uh, and financial processes for outbound investment uh, and an aid, um, specifically in Chinese financial institutions. So the idea of green credit is catching on uh, within China and rating Chinese banks for the quality of their loans. Um, do these loans go to shoddy project, projects or are they going to viable and commercially viable projects? And, and there's a great uh, NGO out of Kunming called Green Watershed led by Dr. Yu Xiaogang uh, who is leading the way on this and gaining a lot of traction. Um, you could be very critical in the approach to uh, understanding green credit where, well, okay, it identifies a few good banks or maybe six of the big eight banks and says these other two banks are there for maintaining the the shoddy investments abroad and keeping the soft budget constraint open, but at least it's a step forward. And, and I think that's, that's the, the general context. We see China moving, it, wanting to take step forward, steps forward um, in its uh, investments abroad and moving from this trend of policy projects or shoddy investments abroad to more commercially viable projects. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, and uh, again, though, the caveat that uh, uh, we, we, we can follow what's happening in China and there's some encouraging things that, that Brian's talked about, but we still don't know the answer in particular as to how the companies will operate abroad and whether they'll change from the model of operating according to local laws, which means uh, they can do more or less whatever they want. Uh, so that, that also remains to be seen, but in, we're, we're looking at, we're trying to look at uh, uh, big data or big changes uh, underlying changes in the in realities that may be affecting these projects, and so uh, that's trying to keep it. Uh, now, uh, just briefly, because uh, we I want to give time for our uh, discussions, definitely, and for questions. But um, we do have in the report uh, a number of policy recommendations, and uh, uh, a lot of them are obvious ones that Courtney has already uh, talked about. Uh, for instance, about transparency, about more research before you start construction. Uh, about better adherence to uh, MRC criteria for the review protocols, et cetera. And uh, uh, so uh, what I'd like, though, just to briefly uh, focus on two recommendations that we've particularly been pushing uh, as, as Stimson, uh, in our, as our, what Brian calls Team Mekong at Stimson. Uh, and that is, uh, first, uh, we've been pushing this idea of uh, there needs to be a Mekong standard for transboundary impacts, uh, for acceptable or maximum acceptable transboundary impacts from upstream, particularly upstream projects. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a sort of a long-term goal, uh, and the problem with it is that it, the, there, it, things that have to be done first, uh, and that is especially uh, countries have to develop their own EIA laws and EIA, EIA regulations and enforcement. And we're a long way from there, although there's some good work being done in Cambodia right now, thanks to a favorable uh, situation with regard to the Ministry of the Environment in, in Cambodia, and which has some more political maneuverability than they've had 
uh, for a long time. Uh, the other thing uh, that we've been emphasizing, and uh, we, we, we keep uh, talking about it um, <laughs> without uh, uh, enough uh, follow through, uh, at least as a, if it's apparent, but it's, it's the idea that um, uh, if, um, if Laos uh, right now, uh, which has no real national electric power grid, they're just uh, clumps of, of uh, nodal points of uh, power availability, uh, and, and uh, if they had a, a grid, uh, they could actually achieve their export revenue goals with fewer dams. Uh, and and there's a rationale for that is one is that they could export uh, peaking power rather than baseload power, which is more valuable. Uh, and they would have to, they could stop buying power from Thailand and other countries in the south uh, if they had a national grid. Uh, they could also sell power to Cambodia uh, from that grid. And the point is that once there's a national grid, once it's tied into the Thai grid, it becomes a regional or, or sub-regional grid. Uh, and uh, so for some people, uh, look at this and they say, uh, uh, it's been studied by the ADB. I mean, we, we, we start talking about a sub-regional grid before we were found out from the ADB and from contacts there uh, in the energy, energy uh, area that in fact, the ADB actually has a, a, a Lao National Electric Power Grid uh, that's been studied, it's been considered viable and it's been discussed with the Lao government, but, uh, and we know personally from our discussions with the uh, Lao uh, Energy Ministry in particular, uh, yeah, they know about this and they, they can see that it would be a good idea in the longer term, but they're, it's not their highest priority. Well, what's their highest priority is to get these, is to get uh, private companies or state-owned companies, whatever, uh, from abroad to, to invest in these uh, concessions uh, these exam projects primarily to support export revenues. So, for instance, Sayaboy Dam, there's, uh, uh, I think there's nine turbines or ten, uh, huh? Yeah, eleven. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, gates and turbines, but 95% uh, of that power will go to Thailand. Uh, and the, the one gate or one, one turbine has been, is a smaller turbine specifically to serve uh, local uh, uh, power needs. Uh, because there's big turbines in the, in the high voltage they put off and the, and the uh, amperage, I guess, that uh, it can't be handled by the lot of grid. So it's all, that has to be all export. Now, uh, people will say, uh, well, what, you're proposing uh, one new Asian Development Bank, big infrastructure project, uh, we know how those things go. And uh, that's a good point, except that, um, uh, what we're what we're trying to talk about, and, and what we've had some success success in sort of promoting the acceptability idea, is that this would be an opportunity for for the first time uh, for any uh, development bank or, or lender or donor uh, investor to develop a project from the ground up as a nexus project. That is, the whole point of the grid is to is to find a way to optimize the trade-offs on a lower make on basin scale. Uh, so that's what we're trying to get at with this idea. And uh, uh, among other things that happened recently is that um, in February uh, of uh, this year, at Poxe, there was a first vice ministerial level meeting of a so-called Friends of Lower Mekong Donors. Uh, and we've been promoting this idea and talking to people in the State Department and the Embassy and Dan Chan and other places, et cetera. And in fact, the U.S. Uh, took the initiative to add this idea of a regional uh, national electric power grid for Laos as, as something that uh, should be should be considered. And at the end of that meeting, uh, uh, there, there was a joint uh, declaration uh, statement by the U.S., the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, I think Australia, Japan, and some other donor companies that uh, that they should support uh, this idea of a national electric power grid for for, for Laos. Uh, and then uh, finally, I just uh, wrap this up now, but one, one angle about this, or one aspect of this, goes back to the issues that uh, 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 Professor Titian uh, is mentioning you know, at the very beginning in terms of the bigger picture. Uh, uh, right now, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the ADB, they can't invest in the mainstream dam as a matter of policy, they're not gonna do it. They'll, but they'll build power lines, and they already have 
uh, you know, a regional electric power grid uh, plan under the Greater Mekong subregion. But the problem with that grid is that it's totally traditional. Uh, what's the most effective way to move large amounts of electricity from from big dam to a big urban market? And that means that countries like Cambodia and Laos themselves, they don't have enough demand to uh, fit into this scheme. Uh, and the other thing is that it's a scheme is a sort of private enterprise oriented in terms of, or enterprise, I should say, private or state owned, uh, in, in terms of uh, power market and power trading. And that hasn't gone down very well with the countries. Uh, so it's not really, that's particular thing is not going very far. So we, we think that uh, this is an idea that um, needs uh, further consideration. We've talked to a lot of people about it. We've, we've informally engaged with everybody from uh, uh, State Department, USAID, the Asian Development Bank, and our Corps of Engineers uh, and our uh, Energy uh, Department. So it's a, it's, it's a valid uh, concept and it's sort where we end. We have to do a lot more study on it and uh, work on the, uh, particularly the issues of, uh, well, is it how feasible? Uh, what, what's the economic feasibility of the idea? Uh, I think I'll, I need to stop there, uh, and uh, uh, so we're glad, uh, happy in the Q&A and, and elsewhere through email or otherwise uh, to talk more about uh, these ideas. Uh, but now I'd like to turn it over to our uh, discussions, and uh, I, I haven't I decided who goes. Okay, Carl, you want to go first? Okay, Carl Middleton. Thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. the three of you. Thank you.